I will, I'm here to present um, the work done by the FMI steering committee in the, into um, in going deeper into the standard interfaces for clocked and scheduled simulations. Um, I will start with some uh, terminology. I'd like to define the term importer as being a tool that imports and interacts with a functional mockup unit, the FMU, uh, we, as opposed to the exporter, which is a tool that exports the FMU. Now in the FMI st uh, standard uh, version 3.0, we have uh, three different uh, interfaces, model exchange, co-simulation and scheduled execution, um, which you can see here. And uh, these, of course, have different characteristics and use cases, but we will be focusing on two uh, sets of functions. Um, one is the synchronous clock uh, set of functions, which form the, the synchronous clocks interface. And the, the other one will be the scheduled execution uh, interface. Now, um, both of these interfaces use clocks and use clocks as, as variables and use functions that interact with clocks, but do have uh, different interpretations of what those clocks mean and what they are used for. Um, so the typical, uh, I will rush through the essence of these two interfaces in these 15 minutes. And um, so I will naturally simplify things as much as possible. And I refer, I ask you to refer to the paper or the FMI steering committee, or FMI standard document uh, for the details. So a typical co-simulation loop uh, or, or model exchange simulation loop uh, has these uh, four main uh, phases. You have some initialization phase, you have the stepping where you alternate between stepping through simulated time and handling events. And then you have a termination phase where um, the resources are freed and so on. Now, uh, we will focus on these two. Uh, this is what is most important uh, for us today. There are um, three types of events that cause you to move, uh, that cause an FMU to be moved from the step uh, mode into the event mode. Uh, the first type of event is a, a timed event where at some point in the simulated time, the FMU informs the, the importer that uh, a time event is to be scheduled, for example, for, for time uh, three, sec three seconds, when time is equal to three. Then the importer records this uh, notion and at some point uh, at the right time, the importer will push the event, the, the FMU into the event mode. Uh, there's a second um, kind of event called an input event. In this case, the importer cha is changing the input of the FMU and pushes the FMU into event mode to, in order to alert the FMU that such event is happening. This typically happens when discrete uh, time uh, inputs uh, are being changed. Finally, we have a state event where it is the FMU that informs the importer of the exact time at which the event should happen and then the importer pushes the, the FMU into that event mode at that time. So we have these three events, uh, three types of events, and you'll see they have their analogs in, in, the, in, the, clocked, uh, in the synchronous clock simulation world. Naturally, events can cause other events. So we need a way to distinguish the timing of these events, and this is when we introduce a two-dimensional notion of time where uh, we have the left to right axis. This is the, the normal simulated time. And then uh, when multiple events, uh, when one event causes another event and so on, we can, we can have multiple events in the same simulated time, but we, they progress in the, what we call the super dense time, which is just an integer counter. So in this case, I have an event here, then I have an event here. And of course, the same variable can acquire multiple values across a different super dense time instant. Each dot here represents one super dense time instant. So we'll start with the first uh, group of functions that we call the synchronous clock uh, interface. This both model exchange and co-simulation FMUs may use clocks under the interpretation of the synchronous clocks interface. So first to start with some uh, motivation, let us, uh, let's look at this uh, abstract supervisory control scenario. 
uh, let's assume we have one FMU, which is a controller, and the rest are just uh, sub-models, for example, of our system. Uh, they don't have to be FMUs. Now, um, every few seconds at some rate R, we want our controller to sample the plant, carry out some action, pass it to the actuation layer, which then computes the actuation on the plant. Uh, once in a while, there's a supervisor who's monitoring the whole thing and decides to reconfigure the controller when some condition happens. So this is like a state event here. And of course, uh, we have the time event uh, representing the sampling of the controller. So the difficulty, there are different ways to execute this um, simulation uh, using FMI 2.0 or 2.1. Um, if the importer is the, the entity that controls this rate R and controls the exact timing of this rate, then um, one could accomplish this simulation simply by the, defining, for example, this, uh, this input as a discrete time input, which then would push the FMU into event mode at the right time uh, when, when, uh, when something changed and all would be well. It will be it will be a little bit harder if we had actuation and sensor if in use rather than just uh, sub models, because then uh, we would also have to make sure that uh, the exact time at which these equations, all the equations in blue, um, we we would make sure that all the equations in blue are enabled at the same exact super dense time. This is harder to accomplish with uh, FM views um, in the FMI 2.1 version. It would, uh, of course, if the FMU were the one controlling the rate R, it would be uh, virtually impossible without um, without using um, extra signals uh, to, for example, discrete time signals to regulate uh, this propagation of, of the events when the FMU wants to sample the system. So uh, this is when clocks come in. And clocks, you can see them as, as a, the evolution of this idea of, of using discrete time signals to signal event information. So clocks are essentially a way to uh, communicate specific events and the, the, the meaning of those events. Uh, a clock at, at any super dense time instant, a clock can either be active or inactive. And, and then these are declared like variables. These are declared in the model description which means we can have input clocks, output clocks, and so on. But I'm not going to go over all the kinds of uh, clock types, but uh, it suffices to look at the two main types, the time-based clocks and the trigger. And the time-based clocks are the analog of time events. So typically we know at some point, either the importer or the FMU knows when they are going to tick. And um, it is always the importer who triggers these clocks. So these clocks are always input and uh, triggered clocks are the analogous of state events, which means uh, they can be either inputs or outputs. And when they are outputs, uh, they are outputs of the FMU, which means it's the FMU who controls exactly when those clocks tick. When they are inputs, it means it's the importer who controls exactly when those clocks tick. Um, clocks can be connected. To other clocks, so output clocks, naturally uh, triggered clocks can be connected to other input clocks, which would also be trigger. Uh, but curiously, uh, the importer may decide to actually connect different input clocks together. And this would mean the same thing as, as, as any two clocks connected together. It, all it means is they, they should take at the same super dense time instant. And it's up to the importer to enforce this uh, this um, condition. Um, variables can be associated to clocks. Uh, this just means that uh, the value of that variable changes only when the clock is ticking, is active. I'm not going to go over all the details, but uh, each clock is then associated to a set of variables. And of course, the equations that span those variables and this all forms a discrete time system that evolves whenever the clock ticks. And the such discrete time system can be written in this form, uh, representing the evolution of uh, the variables whose value, whose next value depends on the previous value. And these variables we would call the discrete time states, the clocked states. And of course, we have also have variables which are just uh, output algebraic uh, functions of, of, of the discrete time states of the clock. So how does 
this interface using clocks solve our initial motivation problem? This is one way to solve it, where we um, we use triggered clocks to connect the supervisor with the controller FMU. This naturally means when the supervisor wants to tick the clock S, then the input clock S of the controller FMU will be ticked as well, which will activate the corresponding equations. And of course, as I said before, you can connect, uh, the importer may allow to connect multiple input time-based clocks together. And all this means is all these clocks will be ticking at the same time. It could still be if the FMU who controls the exact rate R, but it's going to be the importer who reads this value uh, from the model description, for example, or, or from special functions that are used during the initialization of the, of, of the control FMU, and then decides to activate uh, when the time to tick is there, then the importer will activate all the three input clocks of each subsystem. And this means each control, each each uh, subsystem or FMU knows exactly which equations to activate at any super dense time instant. That's the main benefit of using clocks. Okay, so let's go over quickly over the um, a simple example uh, of, of an algorithm that would uh, solve this uh, this scenario. Here, uh, let's assume clock R is about to tick, and that's why the control FMU goes into event mode, is pushed into event mode by, by the importer. The importer activates the clock R. Uh, other clocks connected to R are activated at the, as next step. Then uh, we always need to check, because this is an output trigger clock, we never know when it is going to tick. We check whether this clock is active has been has been is ticking if so then we connect we we activate the connected clocks and of course we exchange the data between the supervisor and the controller i'm just abstracting this as simple copy uh, kind of command data exchange happens at this point and then um, when all and and here note that activating the clocks does not mean executing the equations right away. It just means these equations are active and they have their own dependencies which have to be set uh, accordingly by the importer. So this is when this happens and that also means when new values are calculated and so on. Now there's a final, um, before finishing the super dense time instant, there's a commit uh, function that essentially states that, okay, now the the, your, your new state of the clock becomes the previous state. So that uh, further equations such as this one, where the new value depends on the old one, can be executed. This is an important step because should the importer decide to untick the clock to, for example, come here and set the clock R to inactive, then uh, theoretically these variables uh, have, to be, have to acquire the same the value they had before. So that's why we have this commit step here. Finally, step event just marks the end of this super dense time instance. Super dense time instance started here, ended here. Um, the second interpretation of the clocks is the scheduled execution. Um, it has some similarities with a synchronous clock simulation. Uh, we have the same clock types. Uh, Connected clocks should take at the same simulated time, but here note that because scheduled execution uh, has the main target, the real-time uh, co-simulations, then um, I added a little star here that, you, as you'll see, connected clocks will take at different wall clock times, but they still have to take at the same simulated time. And of course, uh, clock ticks can trigger and schedule other clock ticks, just like in synchronous clock simulation. Now, some differences. Uh, we have a greedy evaluation model. So each tick really executes a task. Um, the distinction, we have to distinguish between simulated time and wall clock time, as I described before. And um, we, have, um, we have multiple tasks. And because um, we have a greedy evaluation and because we are running this in, in real time, co-simulation um, scenarios, tasks can be preempted. They have to be preempted and priorities are needed. So I'll quickly just show you a simple example. Uh, we have an FMU with uh, three partitions. A partition is what is is uh, the part, the equations and code that are executed as part of one task. And one uh, partition is always associated to one clock. Uh, 
So when, when one clock ticks, means this thing is executed, and so on. So here we have multiple periodic clocks. Not, I'm not going to go into the details. And here you can see, for example, that uh, one clock uh, started to execute. You can see wall clock time progressing. Uh, this clock gets uh, activated. That means the task is executed. And of course, as part of executing this, this code, one other clock is scheduled to tick later as like a time event. This is supposed to happen at simulated time t2, but in practice, because this is taking longer to execute, it gets delayed because it, it has less priority. When it finally gets to execute, um, it gets suspended, preempted again, because the other periodic task is executing. So depending on the resources, it may not be possible. One task may be uh, delayed um, quite a bit before getting the opportunity to run. Thank you. That is that is all. I am ready for questions. <laughs>